Hello, I'm Jenny Lynch and this is the Creative Science for Kids podcast. Hi, I'm Matilda and today's show is all about the science of seeds. Let's get growing with five fascinating fast facts about seeds. A deep dive into seed banks, an interview with Cassie Polamini, a children's author who writes stories featuring science, and a see-through seed growing activity for you to try yourself at home. Listen up because here come five fun and fascinating fast facts about seeds. Fact number one. Seeds are made by plants, and a seed can grow into a new plant. Not all plants make seeds, but about 70% of plants do make seeds as their way of creating new plants. Some seeds that you might be familiar with are beans, corn, and pumpkin seeds. Most seeds have a hard outer coating called the seed coat. They have a baby plant inside them called the embryo, and they have a store of food for the baby plant called the endosperm. Fact number two. The smallest plant seeds are less than a millimetre in size, and the biggest plant seeds are over 30 centimetres big. Each type of flowering plant makes a unique type of seed. The smaller seeds in the world are from orchid plants, and the biggest are made by palm trees. A coconut is a type of seed that can float on the ocean to help spread coconut trees to different areas of land. Plants have lots of different ways of spreading their seeds, including being carried by the wind, like dandelion seeds, and sticking to animal fur and being carried away to new places. Fact number three. Humans eat some types of seeds, and farmers use seeds to grow food crops. A grain is a type of seed that's grown for food, and the most common grains humans eat are rice and wheat. When a farmer plants a seed in the ground, the seed will only grow if the conditions are just right, including the right type of soil and weather conditions, such as the best temperature for the plant to grow and the right amount of water. Fact number four. When a seed starts to grow, it is called germination. When a seed is in the right conditions, the seed coat will absorb some water and then crack. The first part of the plant to poke out of the seed coat is the root, which grows downwards. The plant uses energy from the endosperm to grow until it sprouts a stem and leaves above the surface of the ground. The leaves collect light energy from the sun and start to make food to keep the plant growing. Fact number five. If the conditions are not right, a plant will not grow. If the soil doesn't have enough nutrients, if there is too much or too little water, or if the temperature is too hot or cold, a seed will not grow into a healthy plant. Australia has some very unique native plant seeds. For example, banksia plants need fire to release their seeds, and the chemicals in bushfire smoke act as a signal to the seeds that conditions are good for the seeds to start growing. If a seed is kept dry and away from light, it can stay dormant for many years. Being dormant is a bit like the seed is sleeping until the conditions are right for it to wake up and start growing. Seeds are so important for growing our food that countries around the world have seed banks, where they keep seeds for food crops safely stored. Seed banks are also used to store seeds for native plants, as a way of making sure a plant can be grown in the future in case something happens to the plant's environment and it becomes extinct. Australia has a number of seed banks and also sends seeds to other countries for safekeeping. Today, we have a very special guest who writes children's books that include some fascinating science. Can you tell us your name and what do you do? Yes, my name is Cassie Polamini and I'm a children's author. I write picture books and chapter books and I present uh, creative writing workshops and author talks in schools and public libraries. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about the stories you write for children. How long have you been writing children's books? Uh, I got serious about writing children's books about six years ago when my daughter was born Um, and my first book came out in 2023, but I have wanted to be an author since I was about seven years old. Can you tell us a little bit about where you live and work? Yes, I live and work on Boonurong country, which is near the bay in Melbourne. A few years ago, you wrote a beautiful picture book called The Garden at the End of the World. I've read your book and it's a lovely story for young children. Can you describe it for us? Thank you. Um, Yes, The Garden at the End of the World is about a little girl called Isla who loves going foraging and exploring in the forest near her home with her mother, who's a botanist. And one day she finds a rare and special seed pod and she really wants to keep it. 
but her mother tells her about a special place, um, a room hidden in a frozen mountain at the end of the world where they keep seeds safe for future generations. So Isla decides her seeds would be better off there and she travels with her mother to the island of Svalbard, which is in the Arctic, and it's home to polar bears and the Northern Lights. So it's uh, quite a magical place, but it is a real place and the global sea vault is very real too. How did you come up with the idea of writing about the seed vault? And how did you learn about the science behind the seed vault? I visited Norway once a long time ago and I was always really fascinated with that part of the world and how they take care of the environment. And then during the pandemic lockdowns in Melbourne, I watched a documentary about the global seed vault. I'd heard of it before, but uh, that was the first time I saw it up close and inside. And I was just really blown away by what a, a magical place and what an amazing feat of science it is. Um, so I started researching it online and there's a website called Crop Trust. Crop Trust is another organisation that helps manage the vault and you can actually do a virtual tour and go inside the vault and see the landscape all around. Um, and I learned about the permafrost, the frozen soil and that there are 1.3 million seed varieties inside the vault and there's room for up to 2.5 billion. And countries from all over the world, most countries in the world have seeds stored there which is kind of amazing. So that really intrigued me and, um, and deci I decided to write a book about it. I had a little girl at the time, so it became a picture book. You wrote the words for The Garden at the End of the World and an artist called Bryony Stewart created the pictures for the book. What was it like seeing your story turn into a colourful picture book? Yeah, that was really magical. Um, Bryony's a very talented artist and she brought the story to life in a really special way. So because it's all about plants and seeds, she wanted to use plants in making the art for the book. So she did all the illustrations with charcoal, which is burnt wood. So I thought it was really special having plants such a part of the artwork since they're such a part of the story as well. Have you written any other children's books that feature scientific ideas? I have. I, I'm a big animal lover and I'm particularly fascinated by frogs and my daughter and I spend a lot of time in the bush park near our home. She went to bush kinder there and we love listening to the frogs and other wildlife. And that inspired me to write a chapter book series all about friendship and conservation and frogs. So the first book in the series came out last year. It's called Ella and the Amazing Frog Orchestra and it's about a little girl who moves house and discovers a secret frog pond in her neighbour's backyard. And when the neighbours do some renovations and the frog pond is in trouble, she has to help them find a new habitat. And this month there's a new book in this series coming out called Ella and the Sleepover Safari and that's about a slumber party at the zoo for Ella's birthday and during the night an animal escapes and she and her friends have to work out what's happened and, um, and work together to try and help find it. So the stories are all full of lots of animal facts and there's activities at the back, things you can do at home and school like how to build a frog dog in your backyard. Cassie Polomini, thank you so much for being a special guest on the Creative Science for Kids podcast. If you'd like to find out more about Cassie Polomini's books, including her brand new book, Ella and the Sleepover Safari, there will be a link in the show description. You can try growing some seeds for yourself in a see-through container so you can observe the different parts of a plant as it starts to grow. Make sure you tell an adult what you were doing first and check you have their permission. You will need an old CD case, moist soil or potting mix, broad bean seeds, and a shallow tray. If you can't find a CD case, you can try using a DVD case or a clear Ziploc bag instead. Open the CD case and lay it out flat on a bench and take out the plastic inner part. The inner part is often made of black plastic and it has a round part that holds the CD. At the end of the CD case that doesn't have the hinge, add some moist soil or potting mix and place about three broad bean seeds in the middle of the soil. Close the CD case and stand it up in a plastic tray. You might need to lean the CD case against a wall or a box so it stands up on its side with the soil at the bottom. Leave the CD case until the first signs of germination appear with the roots growing down and the leaves growing up out of the seed and continue to observe the plant growing over several days. You'll need to keep the soil moist by adding a small amount of water through the gap at the hinged end of the CD case. 
A dry broad bean stays dormant until it has the soil and water it needs to grow. The seed has enough energy and nutrients to start growing, but it soon starts making food from carbon dioxide gas in the air and takes up water and nutrients through the roots. As the bean plant grows, the different parts of the plant can be observed through the clear CD case, including the roots, stem and leaves. The stem grows up and the roots grow down because the plant can detect light and the force of gravity. Now that we've planted some ideas in your ears, it's time for us to go. Thanks for listening and remember to stay curious. The Creative Science for Kids podcast was recorded on the traditional lands of the Bidjigal people. For more information about Creative Science Australia, visit creativescience.com.au.